last lecture we left off on metal on, uh, on toxins and other stressors in natural environments and we had just entered the realm of metals and other inorganic pollutants um, and there are several areas that this is important um, lead toxicity and waterfowl is, is a big one and um, that is because um, waterfowl eat eat rocks to put in their crop and grind up stuff and um, if lead shot is in the bottom of, of these um, ponds or wetlands and they just eat that and they, they kill themselves because they become over overwhelmed by the lead. Um, now it's been regulated in wetlands but for upland game birds it's, it's still allowed, um, lead shot is still allowed, uh, which is still finds its way into birds and, and poisons them. So I don't think that's a good idea. Um, and, you know, th those of you that hunt probably sh shouldn't use any lead shot if you, if you can avoid it. It's just, it's just not good for wa uh, wildlife. There's also industrial contamination by lead and certainly you've heard of the, the, um, the Flint, Michigan issues with with lead in their water and other places and old pipes. So it's it's a it's an environmental uh, problem in general. Mercury contamination is extremely widespread now um, and even globally. So even if you if you eat large fish, even tuna from the open ocean, um, they have bioaccumulate because they live long enough and they're high enough on the food web that they they biomagnify accumulate and biomagnify considerable amounts and once it enters into our bodies we really can't get rid of it very easily the turnover times are extraordinarily long and this is mostly caused by atmospheric deposition followed by um, methylation um, of mercury um, so elemental mercury is not a in, in itself very super toxic like um i was my, my grandmother had uh a colon cancer and and she had problems getting moving after that and this was in the 60s and they just gave her a ball of mercury and she ate it and then it you know pushed everything through uh so it, the mercury itself is not so toxic but once it gets methylated by microbes it, it really does get quite toxic and is able to bioconcentrate much more easily and almost every state in, in the United States now has fish consumption advisories related to this because when you burn coal, it goes up in the atmosphere and then falls down in precipitation. And it's because it's, it's present in small amounts, um, it, always in a natural environment, and organisms bioaccumulate it, and then, then the coal forms by, by the um, organisms that have died and are you know decompose and kind of compress and, and make coal, but they've concentrated that mercury. In addition, things like thermometers, um, th uh, thermostats, uh, things like that get thrown in the trash, and then many municipalities incinerate their their trash, and then that puts the mercury into the atmosphere, and then it causes uh, problems. In general, um, you shouldn't eat big old fish anywhere. Um, you should try to focus on fish that are growing more quickly or seafood or freshwater uh, fish that grow more quickly and eat lower on the food web if you want to keep from being exposed to this. In addition, um, there's selenium and this is a particular problem um, in uh, the California where it's a very dry climate. They've been uh, piping water in and and, and using it to irrigate their crops. And as the water evaporates, it concentrates. Um, there's an interesting example. There's several of these out there where selenium is actually a cofactor for an enzyme and it's required uh, for metabolism in very, very low amounts. But once it gets very high, it becomes quite toxic. And they have some uh, waterfowl problems in California because they salinated their soil um, by, by not irrigating quite enough and then it, it concentrates and, and gets in this really salty high selenium water, goes down into the water systems and, and concentrates even more. Um, arsenic is a global problem in groundwater and I don't really need to talk much about that uh, for this class because um, we had a really good report on this uh, this week. Um, and, and the problem is, is that some areas are relatively rich in arsenic 
And then if you have agricultural activity and other things that alter the chemistry of the groundwater, then the groundwater releases its arsenic, um, and particularly phosphorus fertilization and, and uh, changes in pH that, that lead to that. I neglected to put the chat on just a sec. So Emma mentioned that arsenic where she lives is 292 times the recommended safe levels. Mm. I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't drink that water. Um, if you have a deionizing uh, cl clear clarification system, uh, something that deionizes the water, that, that should help with with that particular. There, everything I looked up is like super expensive. Um, oh, I would just drink bottled water for your primary water drinking water then. Yeah, Wichita's like working on it and they're building like a new water treatment thing, but I was like, whoa. Yeah, no, that, that's not good. And the long-term chronic effects are, are quite bad. I mean, in a sense, we're fortunate that we live in a place where we have enough money um, to maybe buy, buy water, or find, find clean sources of water. Whereas um, the, really the biggest problems are in India where much, many of the people just don't have enough money to, to buy bottled water. They just have to drink the water that, that's there. And there's some massive health issues associated with it. Uh, the next section is nanomaterials, um, and nanomaterials are those that are less than a micron, sort of in the size of virus in the nanometer range, 10 to the minus ninth, and maybe 10 times 10 to the minus ninth, or 100 times 10 to the minus ninth meters in size. So they're microscopic. Um, they're, many of these are metallic, although not all of them are. So there's a whole, whole range of metallic ones. Silver is the most common common one. It's used in clothing to treat it for odor and antibacterial. Um, and this is part of this microplastic pollution that we've talked about, we'll talk about in a little bit, but then some of these plastic particles also have small amounts of, of silver in them. Um, but there's a whole big class of things that we really don't have a great idea of what they're doing in the environment. So for example, uh, carbon compounds like fullerenes or micro uh, nanographenes, um, and nano, nanotubes are, are being used in a lot of industrial applications. Um, quantum dots, things that react to light, are another one that you know, we just don't know what they'll do in the environment. And, and many tons of these are dumped into the environment, and particularly silver and tin and copper and nano iron. Um, so it, nano, nano titanium is a really uh, interesting example because titanium oxide is white um, and it's used as a um, in sunscreen maybe you've seen those sunscreens where you paint it on and, it, and it's really white you know I mean it just doesn't it, it completely absorbs UV really well um, it's even considered food safe uh, it's used as a whitener in food food uh, coloring so if you get those white donuts they've got titanium oxide on them but what happens when you make it um, nano size is that because of the high surface area, it's quite reactive with the UV and it makes free radicals. And free radicals are energized compounds that have oxygen, um, oxygen and other compounds get, get energized um, and react with everything. Uh, and so they're using a lot of this, but it's not really clear what the, what the environmental impacts are going to be of that. Um, I mentioned nano silver being common in clothing, treated for odor. It's also used uh, on things like plastics and subways and stuff like that, where people touch something a lot, so they want it wants to, they want to knock back the the bacteria. Well, these or these do not tend to bag, biomagnify. Um, they can get into cells. So if you have a really high concentration, they're small enough particles that they'll work their way into, into inside of cells. And there's still quite a, quite a bit of concern about those. Um, one of the things that I was interested in, I saw a paper last year on, I, I believe it was lanthium being used to control cyanobacterial blooms by a Chinese group. Um, and then they did toxicity, but they, but uh, they put it in the supplementary material and the toxicity was really pretty high for things um, uh, that Daphne and the test organisms they used as Ola. But uh, 
I just saw that there's a company in Utah that's using it to, and dumping it into lakes. Uh, so, so there's really not, it's not really don't use the, the testing requirements are not so stringent as far as doing the, of using these. This, this is something that's only been coming about in the last you know, decade or so. So this is this, I think this will be an increasing problem rather than a decreasing problem. Um, in general, though, nanomaterials are negative, have negative responses overall. And so this is uh, on the y axis is what's called a log response ratio. And it's basically where, when you have a bunch of different kinds of experiments, they may be looking at response to nanomaterials uh, could be growth or survival or metabolic rate or anything like that. And you have a rate in the control and a rate in the, in the treatment. And if you take the log difference of those, then you can get what's called a response ratio and compare different responses, just how responsive something is, is what it's saying. And on this axis, a negative response means the organism was harmed in, in the experiment. And the nanomaterials are along the X axis, the elements are of, of them. And the number of studies that we found associated with each of these particles is shown here. So in learning how to read these line ones, that um, long, long line on CG, that I don't know what it means. Like is the dot where you should be looking? It looks like it is like dangerous and not dangerous at the same time. Uh, yeah, no, that's a great question. Uh, so the dot is the mean response and the uh, bar around the outside is the 95% confidence interval. So of all the eight studies here, right, 95% certain that fut any future experiment will fall within these bands here. Okay, so a shorter line would be less confidence? A uh, shorter line's more confidence. So this is very constrained. The silver has this strong uh -huh. negative effects and you're pretty certain it's gonna have a negative effect when you do experiment. Something like silicon, right? We know like silicon is used by diatoms, right? Um, so something like silicon has some negative effects and others not. So it sort of centers closer around zero. So it may or may not be toxic. Mm -hmm. We do know and specifically that silicon can be toxic to people because of silicosis. So you breathe it into your lungs and it, and it harms your, it, um, sort of agitate your lungs and increases the rates of lung cancer, just like asbestos does. So in CG um, is uh, uh, carbon graphite, nanocarbon graphite. Uh, this one is really wide. So some experiments have really, some responses are really negative and others were closer to zero, but it's still um, on average, you're still saying it's a negative effect. The statistically you'd think it was a negative effect. All right, thanks Emma, that was a really good question. In, anything else? Okay, I'm, I'm kind of breezing through this. You really do need to look at the book uh, and read it because uh, the, I'm, I'm just giving you the highest level and I can certainly ask questions at a, at a finer level than this. Um, there's well more than 70,000 uh, organic compounds created by humans and used by humans and several hundred new ones each year. And there's really not a global testing program or anything like that to be sure these are okay to release into the environment. And we talked about the idea that there might be multiplicative or synergistic effects. So also there's really almost zero testing on how they might interact with each other. Um, some of the biggies, petroleum products. Uh, urban runoff is huge. So, you know, we, we spill a lot of uh, gas and oil. Um, when we burn it, not all of it's completely burned and it, and it falls down to the ground. Uh, tires are continuously wearing down on vehicles. Well, that, that organic material has to go somewhere, right? It's, it's, it's a fine powder and it washes off of the roads and through the storm sewer system and into, into the, um, into the ground, into the water um, systems. Uh, Two-stroke engines are really bad as far as like outboard motors. Um, uh, a 20 or horsepower two-stroke engine can make 11,000 cubic meters of water undrinkable in an hour. 
11,000 cubic meters of water is a lot. I mean, that's like a pond's worth or more. Um, so if you do buy a two, uh, engine, you need to, um, you need, you need to uh, try to get a four stroke. Uh, that are just not nearly as polluting as the two strokes. Um, and Emma says, uh, don't snarf donuts in parking lots. It's bad for the environment, key takeaway. That's true. And if you have a two stroke engine on your go-kart, that's even worse. Um, chlorinated hydrocarbons also concentrate in the sediment. So one of the big problems that we'll see uh, is the chlorinated hydrocarbons tend to be um, the carcinogenic ones, many of the big ones that we've had troubles with, uh, pesticides and herbicides and, and uh, industrial products that cause, that cause either toxicity or, or, or cancer, um, they tend to be uh, real problems and they tend to be not so water soluble, so they concentrate, they get on the sediments and they sit there. So th things like PCB clean, clean up um, just take a long time once it gets down in the environment. Um, atrazine could well be the most common organic contaminant that we see in the waters, surface waters of the United States at the highest levels. And one of the things that was of concern was that um, if you use pesticides uh, or herbicides that were organic, um, and if they tended to not be water soluble, then they tend to biomagnify, which we, we talked about already in this, in this lecture. Um, and so atrazine is actually quite water soluble. It means it can run off fairly well. And atrazine in, uh, interferes with photosystem too. So it is a uh, inhibitor of photosynthesis. It's commonly used in agricultural areas around here. Every spring, the amounts of, of atrazine in the Tuttle Creek Reservoir are extraordinarily high as they apply it in the spring and then the big rains come and wash it in, into the into the um, reservoir in the, in the river. Um, so not only does it poison algae and macrophytes directly, um, but it also appears to be um, perhaps a, a hormone mimic and, and poisons frogs. So these are some of the big ones, but again, there's thousands and thousands of them out there. And I don't think, yeah, okay, I got endocrine disruptive compounds. We also had a nice report on plastics and microplastics. And so you can divide plastic pollution into different sizes. So large pieces greater than a half a millimeter. Microplastics um, between a micron and five, uh, five millimeters, perhaps. And that should probably be 0.5 millimeters. And submicron uh, particles, nanoplastics. When you throw away a bottle, it will slowly break down. And any other plastic, it will slowly break down. And um, as it breaks down, it's gonna make smaller and smaller particles. So there's continuous generation of these small particles. And some of the particles are quite small. So I believe it was Sean's uh, paper that talked about um, the microbeads used in exfoliants and things like that. So there are some actual that are created um, small to start with. Uh, every time you wash uh, synthetic clothing, it releases some fibers. And I, you know, it's interesting because I have seen this for years and I'd see some kind of, for some reason, the blue ones really, really hang in there. And I'd go looking at algae and I'd, I'd see these little fiber things. I just didn't really never, it didn't click with me what they were, but it's, you know, they're everywhere that you can find these things in, in, in water everywhere. And um, that's be because as we wash our, our synthetic clothing, it breaks down. And as I mentioned, now many of the products like athletic socks and any, any of the clothing that you buy that says it, it has odor protection, usually means it has nano silver in it. So it, it not only has the plastic of, uh, parts, but um, but it, but it also could, could include things like dyes and, and, um, and, this, and silver, which is, which is toxic to some organisms. So they can be toxic. Um, you know, any colored plastic has, has these dyes or paints in it and, and they're not necessarily uh, good for you. Um, they're, they're oftentimes in products that, you know, you wouldn't consume, so they, they're not used uh, for that, but they do work their way into the environment. They can clog uh, filter feeding organisms. So we'll, we talk about, we'll talk about things that eat bacteria um, and any of those things that eat bacteria, if there's a bunch of stuff that's not, um, 
you know, not food, then it, it, it can basically interfere with the rate they can get food in. And that'll be in the next couple lectures. They can carry pollutants, um, things that are organic, um, that, that are uh, hydrophobic, right? And they could absorb onto particles and these plastics are organic carbon as well. Um, more inert than some of these other compounds, but they can basically keep them up in suspension um, because they'll, they'll get on the surface of the plastic. So you can just think about if you have a piece of plastic and, and you put it in oil, the oil can stick on some of the plastics. It's really hard to get the oil off. Like, you know, washing a plastic bowl that you put salad in, right? It can take a lot. And that's because those organics are getting on there. Um, and it can offer refuge for pathogenic bacteria and perhaps viruses. So one of the things that happens, you know, when, when bacteria get in the environment is they've got to compete with the other bacteria. And so sewage treatments is all about that, is, is getting rid of pathogens by out-competing them. But if they can find a refuge from being eaten or being, you know, being um, inactivated in some way, uh, that, and that plastic, that microplastic can, can form that, cause that. Um, and the next one's estrogen uh, disrupting compounds. And uh, so these are endocrine disrupting compounds are essentially signaling uh, compounds mimics. So we use hormones in our body uh, as signals, not as, um, and they, then they, they trigger biological uh, responses, right? B because of this, because they are just meant to be a signal, the less you have to make of them, the better off you are evolutionarily because it takes energy to make these complex compounds. So things like adrenaline and estrogen and, and testosterone and all those, you really need small amounts to, to have a big effect on the way biological systems work. Um, and these uh, are ecoestrogens or mimic estrogen and many compounds include DDT um, mimic estrogens. We, we talked about this as um, in one of the paper reports of being a pollutant, um, relatively common pollutant because um, women take birth control pills, which are basically uh, estrogen mimics and they work their way through the sewage treatment and um, go out in the, in the environment. And, and we know that estrogen is not just a human uh, human hormone, it is a, a hormone that many different organisms use to regulate uh, their, their reproductive systems. So the thing that's interesting about these is being active at minute concentrations is that you could do a toxicology test and drop the concentration down and then, you know, you'd see the effect go away. Um, the, what people found out was the first person that, um, that, uh, really brought this to the attention of, of the public did these assays. And for some reason they decided to put lower and lower and lower concentrations in, and they were using amphibians and uh, they, they, f this, they found out that all of a sudden they started getting these reproductive disruptions at these extraordinarily low concentrations. Uh, and this turned out to be a, pretty um, controversial thing because they were using atrazine and, and the chemical companies just really went after them. But it turned out to be a real thing. Um, and these things can be bioconcentrated. They can pa be passed to offspring. Um, they, they, they are, you know, they're, it's not necessarily good for wildlife and, 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 and people uh, that are drinking the water. And there's different combinations of organic chemicals can interact to um, interact with estrogen acceptors. So it's a very, very complex problem. We can see uh, the results of this in many surveys that have, have happened now throughout the United States where they've looked at feminization of wildlife. And um, for example, there's been really broad surveys of, of fishes, of sports fishes in the United States and the number of uh, number of fish that have developmental um, disruption from from pr presumably from these ecoestrogens is is really high and it's gone up considerably over time. So this is a this is a problem that probably emerged in the last twenty years, um, and it doesn't seem to necessarily be going away. Although there's some some interest in it, there's not really. 
laws that regulate releasing uh, estrogen mimic, uh, mimics into the natural environment at this point that, that I know of. Okay, so question of the day. Um, we've already sort of talked about this a little bit. Uh, drugs are regulated with what's called the precautionary principle. So before we can have a drug that's used for humans, we, a company would, has to go through a process to prove they won't cause harm. And they start by doing testing on, on animals or maybe on cell lines and then move eventually to human trials. Um, and once they prove adequately that the side effects are, are less than the good that they can, they can provide, um, then they're allowed to release them. So in contrast, many of these other chemicals like herbicides, uh, while the companies will, will want to test them to some degree uh, to make sure that they're not just gonna kill everyone when they put it out in the environment, they're not really held to the same standards per se. Um, and generally, rather than use a precautionary principle, they are used until there's harm that's proven, right? Instead of proving before they use it that there will be no harm, they, they, they apply them and then eventually, if there's enough harm, then the, then, then the EPA in the United States steps in and says you can't do this and does their testing. Um, so we need pros and cons of applying the precautionary uh, principle to compounds that will be released in the environments. Um, and we can consider endocrine disrupting compounds as, as an example. Good, we got a lot of really good answers. Um, and people are really cut, sort of homing in on the kind of things um, that, that are are out there. So many of these chemicals have provided tremendous benefits to humans, right? And maybe the argument over DDT would be one of those where people kind of could go either way. That DDT caused tremendous environmental damage, showed up in breast milk in humans. It's a hormone mimic. So there's all kinds of, of, of problems with it. Uh, but it also did control malaria in large parts of the world and maybe saved lots of lives. Um, so it will cost a lot to do all this testing, right? Um, and, and it may slow the use of valuable compounds. Um, and, and, and the pros of using the precautionary pr principle would be to require a company to prove that they're not going to cause harm by releasing a chemical would, would save maybe in the long run more money and more health. Um, but that's sort of the, the arguments that go on. Um, the endocrine disrupting compounds are an example. You know, the pro is uh, of birth controls would be uh, pills would be ease of, of contraception and not having to mess around uh, with stuff and, and preventing unwanted births and, and, and the money that that might actually cost people. And, you know, and the cons are, are it entering the natural world and, and causing serious disruption to the wildlife that that, that is downstream. Part of these pros and cons are, are uh, a ethical issue that do we believe the natural world has its own, own um, right to exist without being harmed by us. And so that's not really a thing you can argue through science. It's something, it's a lot of these things are just trying to get at the ideas of, of pushing this further into, into the real world in addition, once we know what the effects are and we have the information. So one way we can deal with some of these pollutants is using microorganisms to mediate pollution, usually microorganisms. And the reason for this is that they rapidly evolved the ability to withstand and use organic compounds. So an example of this is, is uh, antibiotic resistance, where organisms have really um, quickly uh, evolved ways around antibiotics, sometimes either breaking, breaking them down or becoming resistant to them. Um, and uh, the ability to respond to toxins by microorganisms uh, is oftentimes transmitted laterally uh, through plasmids. So if you go out into lakes in the middle of Australia, uh, we're far, far from human habitation, 
you can uh, isolate bacteria that have antibiotic resistance to antibiotics that are only used on humans, right? So they've, the genetic material has moved out into the, into the environment. Um, this can work to humans' advantage uh, because if you have an, a groundwater spill of some organic compound, and it's in a heterogeneous aquifer. Remember, heterogeneous is really tough to follow the, all the flow paths and get down in everywhere. Sometimes the easiest way to clean up the pollution is to use bacteria to strip it out of the water. So you can either push the bacteria down into the system that are able to break down the, or say it's oil or something like that. Um, and, or you can pump the water up and pump it through a, a Fil a big filter thing that has those bacteria in it and then pump it back down in. Um, oftentimes when they put it down in uh, the groundwater, they'll also fertilize to get the bacteria going with something else. And what happens oftentimes, let's say there's a compound naphthalene and you have microbes that have the plasma that are adapted to bring down naphthalene. You inject them into the natural environment and if you go back and sample for those, they, they disappear very quickly. They, they can't compete. Yet, if you look in the other microbes that are naturally there, they've acquired the ability to break down naphthalene by transferring the plasmid in, in, into them. The plasmid has been transferred into them. So plasmid is just a little uh, loop of DNA, an extra chromosome, if you will. And there's different mechanisms that, they can, that it can move uh, be, be, between bacteria. Um, so this is a, uh, you know, something that, you know, is really used uh, that, and it's based on evolution that, and, and we've, we've already seen this when we're talking about the nutrient cycles that almost every compound that has potential energy in the environment will be used by some microbe uh, to create energy or harvest energy or give itself a benefit. And so even these plastics, which are really difficult to break down, some microbes have evolved the ability to start breaking them down. But things more, less, less recalcitrant compounds, they evolve the ability to do so more rapidly. So this is good in, in the sense that we can use evolution and microbes to our advantage. Suspended solids is a, a big one uh, around here, for example, uh, the Fremont expedition when it came through, uh, on the Kansas River, they came to the Blue River, which flows by here, and it's called the Blue River. They called it a clear and handsome stream. <clears throat> the Blue River is not clear and handsome anymore. It's full of, of sediment. It's always turbid, and that's because of upstream uh, agriculture that's disrupted the land and, and, and put a legacy of sediment in there that will take a long time to get out. Um, some of that's good. Um, some, of the, some of the particulate material moving into aquatic systems is good because it can be organic carbon that feeds things. Um, it has to flow through a reservoir where that carbon then is metabolized and falls out. So it's just not like the natural river. Um, fine sediments, inorganic sediments, then really can't do anything for most organisms. They can smother invertebrates. Um, but if they have organic material in them, they can serve as food source for filtering invertebrates. So, so there's this, this thing where they can be food, but if they're inorganic, then probably not. They have the largest physical mass of any pollutant in fresh waters globally. Um, there are places where it can fill gravel and interfere with fishery production. Anybody know why that happens? What happens with the, in that case? So things like bluegills build these, um, you know, they can build nests and salmon build these nests and stone rollers will build piles of rocks and they put their eggs in them. And how, how does it interfere with the, with the um, if you get a bunch of sediment on top of those, that gravel and rocks, how does that interfere with the uh, ability of the, of the fish eggs to, yeah, chokes them out when being more specific than that. No oxygen, yes, exactly. Yeah, so it basically makes it so the water doesn't flow past them, so the CO2 builds up and the oxygen can't go anywhere, <clears throat> can't come in. 
They also can increase light extinction rates and lower phytoplankton production. So Tunnel Creek Reservoir, again, nearby here is a highly turbid system. Really, the chlorophyll values are quite low considering how much nutrients there. Um, it, just, it just increases the light extinction rates and doesn't allow for, for photosynthetic uh, production in systems. <clears throat> So you can imagine the Blue River that was blue for a long time had a lot more algae growing on the benthic and, and uh, grazers did better as historically. And then filling reservoirs becomes a huge economic problem. Um, most reservoirs will, will fill eventually anyway, um, but how fast they fill has a, big, has a big influence. So again, I use Tuttle Creek Reservoir a lot as an example because it's a large reservoir nearby here. And it is about a third full. It's lost about a third of its capacity since it was built in the, in the late 50s. Um, now they're trying all these different ways to blow the sediment out. What would really make sense would be to um, control future sediment inputs from above, but uh, uh, regulating agriculture is not very popular uh, in, in the United States and many other places. So this is a big reason why a lot of reservoirs are, are knocked down, uh, that are taken out. And then you have to deal with the fact that all the sediment that's built back up there is gonna come down in one big blob and really, and really harm things. Thermal pollution is another one. Um, and this is the most common where power plants need cooling water and um, they, they, need to cool, they need to cool off uh, their uh, they basically get their steam um, cooled off uh, to run the generators and then they need to do something with that excess heat and they'll dump it into uh, off into cooling systems. <clears throat> we already talked about how zebra mussels can interfere with power plants uh, because they clog the cooling water pipes. But we can get situations where um, increased temperatures and water can uh, extend the range of exotic invaders. Uh, and interfere with reproductive cycles and timing. So a lot of organisms key in on temperatures. Um, they can lead to death of heat intolerant species, with trout being an example um, that are quite sensitive to um, higher temperatures. And this research started happening in the 60s or so, <clears throat> but it's become very relevant to global warming because we are thermally polluting essentially the entire world right now by warming the atmosphere and the freshwater systems. We're also adding a lot of salts to uh, systems. And so this is just an example. We, we, we saw right at the beginning that the more salt you add to a stream, the lower the invertebrate diversity was, one of the early slides in this chapter. Um, and here is an example of a stream that's next to a highway since the 60s in the light open circles and a nearby stream uh, that's still in forest. And you can see the road salt that they've added over the years just continues to build up and bring the concentrations higher and higher of chloride in that system. So the toxins are, are basically building up. And this is, this is ubiquitous everywhere that they use salt on roads to, um, in, in the winter to, uh, to, to keep people from sliding off the road. Again, you know, there's this sort of precautionary pr principle thing, or, you know, is it better for people to not get in accidents or can they find other ways, other technologies to, to deal with this? Um, those are questions that are outside the realm of this class, but we do know that there are negative effects. Mm -hmm. 